family moves out of the city to get away from it all. Slowly, they started noticing strange things about their neighbors. Underneath the veneer of suburban innocence and uh, happiness, is there something sinister going on? And that's basically the story of the Stepford Wives. And that's the show we'll be talking about this week. I'm John Chang with Dan Edmonds. Hello, once again. <laughs> One of the things that we see over the years is how media kind of portrays the role uh, between men and women and, and their roles themselves. Um, in different ways and it really influences, I think, society. So there's this kind of like, you know, media influencing society and society, of course, you know, kind of influencing what's portrayed and stuff. So this is kind of curious what your thoughts are about how that has changed over the years and um, how that's influenced you personally even. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, <clears throat> in the way um, society portrays uh, women in the media and um, how it's, well, given these two films over different time periods mm -hmm. uh, as very sort of strong examples. Yeah. There's a very, um, you know, there is a very extreme um, idea with the, with the 70s version that uh, women have found their independence and where this will go is kind of like a, an unknown quantity in in those early days yeah, and that's true. i think i think that's what provoked such an extreme kind mm. of tale from the original stepford wives <laughs> whereas i would say um the 2004 one it takes this view of almost a post-feminist angle and looks at more kind of like um perhaps the confusion about how the media portrays women you know should they be the the kind of the superwoman who can do everything mm -hmm. or you know do they feel like they lack something from not being more of a traditional kind of mindset mm -hmm. or so that that kind of seems to be the the angle that that one plays on um i mean i, I think it you know it's it's constantly changing and i think the obviously the biggest change recently of oh, we can't you know say without me too <laughs> and all of the various sort of um, lawsuits and mm. various other things, you know, this becoming pretty much, um, you know, we, we really got um, a look behind the scenes with the Me Too movement as to yeah. what really goes on. Yeah. Um, and uh, this has a kind of an interesting, it's funny in a way, I think that's what, there's an, there's an underlying tone of the original Stepford Wives and even to some degree the 2004 one that still has mm -hmm. quite a lot of relevance. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think it's so much in terms of how women's sort of feminist struggles are sort of portrayed in them, but more over the this kind of underlying theme of the disnification of mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. um, in that you've got um, in the first one, one of the 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 bad you know the bad guy mm -hmm. who used to work for Disney. <laughs> and he create, right, you know, right. he's the one who's creating the animatronic women. Yeah. But it, it's this idea that um, there's a surface level of society mm. that looks very pristine and is very polished mm -hmm. and manicured. And underlying it, there's a whole bunch of sort of mechanics and ugly stuff going on that actually makes mm. this stuff work. And it's this kind of, that's the kind of general theme I think actually ties all of this with much more yeah. sort of relevant issues with, mm -hmm. with with stuff that's going on today. Yeah, definitely kind of uh, made me think of Westworld and the things we talked about there, mm -hmm. where, you know, like different times, um, we, you know, our, our patterns, if you will, in our lives, like kind of have these patterns. And it's like kind of that, uh, you know, the cleaning that we see the women doing stuff like that. And, and just like where it's portrayed of kind of, there's a lot of things that are very mechanical that we do and these routines that we have and stuff. And yeah. um, it's it's kind of like a lens to look at that. And then I think it's also interesting how, um, like I said, it's like this idea of the things that are on the surface and where, um, you know, appearances, right, especially in the suburbs sometimes can be, you know, much more important than anything else. Like if you um, kind of notice they came from the city and one of the things that she said that really struck me was, you know, this isn't me, that's not you, like, kind of, you know, to the husband. Yeah. And that struck me about how, like, um, you know, they kind of see that, like, or they see this themselves as, like, you know, oh, when we were in the city, we were more genuine, right? And we were more, more ourselves and stuff like that. 
but um, that is something that I have to admit that like uh, suburbs or small towns and stuff like that, there's this kind of like, um, even though like on the surface, it seems like people are all friendly and everyone kind of, you know, um, what's it called, uh, everyone kind of gets along and, you know, like kind of it's safe and all that kind of stuff. But um, as we call, also mentioned before, sometimes these, sometimes the uh, serial killers and stuff like that, like kind of some of the, you know, most horrific things kind of happen underneath a lot of veneer and stuff. Yeah. And I think you, that's a very good point you bring up about the suburbs, about how they move from the city and the city is portrayed as, you know, where you can yeah. be you, the real, real self and right. the suburb isn't because the suburbs really were created as a, as a post world war two, mm. they were manufactured basically yeah. to yeah. stop, you know, post-war probably PTSD um, soldiers forming gangs or forming societies that would rebel against the government. That was the <laughs> whole idea of putting these neighborhoods outside of mm. cities and trying to sort of, you know, make them pristine so right. and, and giving people easy kind of loans so that they could they could settle in, get mm -hmm. themselves established, get themselves a house, wife, job, etc. Right. And have them going in and out of the city it was all kind of a post-war engineering mm. fact. But so we're you know we're looking at something that is you know manufactured manufactured in a way. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And and you really feel that too, where um, you know in the original stuff, Earth wise. You, you see like kind of the strong idea that, um, you know, the houses, even though they, um, you know, make, have slight differences and stuff, but they're kind of like rubber stamped to kind of like have this very suburban look and stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, they don't really look, you know, like kind of that, like if you go somewhere like Berkeley though, it's kind of funky kind of, you know, even though like uh, Berkeley, the town itself is somewhat like the suburbs of San Francisco to a degree, but it's still like kind of uh, very much has a very funky vibe and stuff like that. And, um, but then, you know, the further out you go, the more you get into like kind of these rubber stamp kind of, you know, houses and stuff, these tracks, homes, you know, and, uh, you know, um, what they call, I think it's, uh, I forget the name of it, but I think it's like planned urban development and stuff, PUDs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, on a completely sort of side note, you know, the, the irony here is that now when you watch HGTV or something mm -hmm. like this on home improvement mm -hmm. stuff, they want to make their houses often look like yeah. lofts in New York. You know, it's kind of a and complete it, switching. And even in China, like kind of um, the newer homes that like the, the developments and stuff like that, they emulate the American kind of suburban look and everything like that, you know, cause you, it, which is kind of funny because you think that like they were trying to maybe um, have something that modeled off the traditional, you know, uh, villages and all that kind of stuff, but they want none of that. They want the kind of, the American dream, if you will, and stuff. So yeah. it's like, in other words, that's what they kind of imported is this dream ideal and stuff like that. Absolutely. And I mean, I think as well, well one thing I've always interests me about home, uh, sort of in, you know, I'm really going off on a tangent here, but <laughs> this idea of like, what, what do we actually kind of like design our homes around? Because mm. a lot of the style now is right. that they're, they're looking at stuff that's kind of industrial or loft like. Mm. Um, and this, this, in, this whole idea of industrial really fascinates me in, in mm. home design because it's kind of like there aren't any factories around anymore. Mm -hmm. So right, now we right, want right. to make our houses look like factories. Right. It, and it's kind of like this blurring of lines where people are working from homes and people actually want to have kind of like sparse <laughs> kind of empty <laughs> houses that look like offices or factories. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a really strange kind of uh, yeah. thing for people to adopt. Yeah. The only thing I could think of is um, that the, that somehow that became the Vogue because it's echoing, uh, you know, like kind of something that like, you know, they're around the, the rest of their days, right? Like, you know, like in other words, the um, typical Silicon Valley office space has that look. And so yeah. they spend most of the day there, you know, like, you know, all extended hours. So they would come home, right? They want to, you would think that, like you said, you would, they would want something homey and stuff, but no, they want something that's no. kind of, again, familiar and everything. It's, it's so strange. I did a, <laughs> when we first started talking about trying to remodel our house, I mm -hmm. looked at, I listed up all these things and mm -hmm. then I went to work the next morning. I thought, what the hell? I've just <laughs> taken <laughs> everything from my work and I've just put it in my house. It's very surreal. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's nostalgia or what it is, or it's more kind of like the familiarity. It's, it's a very odd one. Well, I mean, even like the original homes and stuff like that, right? Like there's this idea of designing things around the hearth, you know, like, and, and, mm. and the hearth, right, it's really, I mean, maybe in the medieval ages or something like that, it made sense because you needed, you know, like kind of that central 
heating, you know, like from a real central heat and stuff like that source. But as time went on, you know, there is such a thing as ventilation and you know, conducting yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But yet we still have like, um, you know, this desire to have like kind of the fireplaces being like kind of the center pl- you know, piece and stuff like that. And, you know, oh, by the way, like a lot of times we'll even have like a TV that's mounted above it and like, kind of, you know, like, whereas we, you know, like kind of had this idea of like maybe gathering around the fire to kind of share stories and stuff. Now we have this, mm-hmm. you know, big uh, LCD or LED kind of um, fire that's kind of, you know, that we're gathering around for stories. I just want to point out, this is one of my <laughs> personal pet peeves as a video okay. file, okay. because really, if you're, and as someone who watches a lot of movies and TV, if you're actually, ideally, you want to have things at eye level. Mm. So, you know, you're basically just now moving all the comfort level of what you're viewing yeah. up here, and you can't actually, like, properly watch it anymore, so. Right. But anyway, yeah. I mean, I, also, I mean, I would say in some respects now, it seems... The, the weird thing for me is now kitchens have become like the things you show off in houses, mm, yeah. but rarely do they get used. You know, right, right. see things like California mansions and stuff like this. And like, how many of those are actually getting cooked in? You know, when you have right. such cheap food that you can eat out, there's a million choices. Like how many of these amazingly, you know, $500,000 kitchens ever get used for anything other than, well, you know, but yeah, like you see, say, um, what's it called? Apparently in, in, in Stepford though, like, you know, that's like kind of the central activity <laughs> for the wives. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a funny sort of way, I wonder if that's the kind of like the idealized version to some degree of what, they, what you would view <laughs> these. I mean, that, that was what I also liked about the 2004 one. I'm mm-hmm. jumping around a bit here. Sure. Was this, and cause there's quite a lot of social satire, which was yeah. quite good. I don't, I don't think it actually worked as a movie as a whole. And I don't right. really think it's, some of the sort of more underlying things made sense. Mm. But one thing I did like was this idea of them making fun of the McMansions, mm-hmm. you know, as they're driving through Stepford, there's these right. huge sort of enormous kind of bloated, uh, you know, suburban yeah, houses, seen, yeah. which, um, which is really are like, I am sure there's several architects, especially like Frank Lloyd <laughs> Wright, rolling over in their graves, looking at those uh, sort of things. I just find them so horrendous, but. But I, think, but I think between, you know, like kind of the 75 and 2004, I think what that captures though is that like, I think in some, I don't know, maybe back of our mind kind of ways like that, um, I think a lot of people still view that as like kind of the ideal suburban kind of home and stuff like I, I, Absolutely, I could, yeah. I, I'd say that that's, you know, like kind of, even if we're not like kind of, maybe we wouldn't admit it to ourselves or like kind of, it's, it's like kind of somehow that's been embedded so deeply, I think, as like an ideal and mm. I think that's what both movies did a great job of, of like kind of, you yeah. know, just capturing that. And, um, you know, it, it's, I think from that stems like the other things of like, okay, um, you know, if we had a Betty Crocker kind of, you know, woman stuff like that, what would she be like? Like literally like Betty Crocker, then you know, kind of, she'd be in the yeah. kitchen cooking, cleaning. And, and well, I think that's what, one thing that's really interesting about the, um, the 70, 74 version is that um, one of the main women in it is, uh, I can't remember the name of the character, but she's played by Nanette Newman, who's actually an oh. English actress, okay. who is famous for doing um, the fairy liquid dishwasher adverts oh, in the funny. UK. And so she's always like the sort of the doting house mother, right. housewife in those adverts. And it's not like, Hands that do dishes can be as mm-hmm. soft as your face with with <laughs> mild green fairy liquid. And she wow. was like the face of that. So she right, was right. almost like the typical kind yeah. of uh, Stepford wife right. or in, in UK households to some degree. Yeah. I mean, but the fact that... I'm but sure I that was chosen intentionally. <laughs> but, but what was quite shocking for me was uh-huh. the fact that in one of the early scenes, as a gra- you know, the husband goes up and sort of grabs her from behind by the, by the boobs, and you're just like, "Wow, that's that's the dishwasher lady." But anyway, that was <laughs> that was uh, it's quite quite interesting that he that he used her. I mean, I think wow, there was the, she was the wife of the um, director, which mm. I'm sure is why. But it's in a funny sort of way, I actually kind of liked the fact that they didn't portray all the women as supermodels Mm. because i think in a way that actually reinforces the this idea that um actually men probably don't want somebody super super attractive because it's too threatening there's someone who wants that much control and i think a lot of stepford wives is about control yeah um you know they want someone who can sort of you know 
who isn't, you know, who's contained in a box very much like, you know, their behavior is. Yeah. And I think that's something that is, again, stems from uh, between the media and, um, you know, like kind of what's been ingrained to our cultures of this idea that like, you know, oh, you know, I kind of, you know, that's the kind of um, girl or, you know, woman that uh, you go out with and stuff. But if you're going to take her home to mom, then, you know, she's going to be something that's going to be more acceptable for that and stuff. And yeah. I think, you know, that's really what it comes down to is that like we have this double standard for, um, you know, kind of lust attraction versus stability and, and home life and stuff like that. Um, mm. You know, like, Chris Rock is, you know, kind of notorious for this one skit that he talks about, like, kind of that, like, uh, you, you fired from me with the, I, yeah, I know the one. Yeah, you mean, yeah. I know the one. I know the one. And, but, and it's so true, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, Which is why we find I mean, it funny. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Apparently, it made Ira Levin, the, the novelist, quite angry that he made hmm. that choice to make them more kind of homemaker style. Oh, why is that? Uh, he actually wanted them portrayed as kind of like sex oh, kitten, supermodel think. style women. And because he, uh, he, I think he felt that made a bigger statement on how, I guess, women are visually portrayed in the but, movie. But just even that's why that scene was shocking, right? When they grabbed, you know, kind of the woman by the boobs and stuff like that was, you know, kind of, because that's somebody who has this kind of homey kind of image and everything. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, you know, the behind the green door, right? Like the Ferrelli brothers, you know, kind of capitalized on the fact that like, you know, here's this, you know, ivory soap, you know, kind of, you know, um, queen and stuff like that. Um, and, and she's like, you know, she's being ravaged by these, you know, dudes and everything like kind of like, I think that, um, striking kind of contrast is one of the things that like we, um, you know, like as the, the male psyche, whatever, stuff like that is kind of like, we find it shocking, but also tantalizing provocative and stuff because of, you know, that, that, um, uh, irony is really what it comes down to. I mean, yeah. 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 And I think, um, I mean, it's. It's the 74 version had, um, I mean, I really felt, you, you felt like um, the men were really threatened. And that was the point he was trying to mm. sort of make was that feminism was a real threat to, mm. to these men's control. Um, and I would say as, as characters, um, Catherine Ross's character, Joanna, is much more single-minded mm. than than the characters maybe even in the 2004 one mm -hmm. um and and it's quite um i mean i think what surprised me about the movie was it's quite slow like the first yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a two-hour movie and the first yeah. hour and a half is really quite kind slow of, paced it's and kind it's, of taking your time going into the suburbs and settling in like it really kind of walk you walks you through the paces yeah and i mean her, the the sort of um when you see the the friendship that she builds up with um the other um the other character who i also i can't remember mm. her name um but she's really this kind of you know slightly tomboy very charming sort of character and really right, right. is you know you really sort of fall in love with that character and it and that makes it quite sort of heartbreaking when uh mm. you know she does get turned into a robot because you realize that's the last person she's can she can really identify with in the, in, the, in the society but i think the last half an hour is really quite chilling actually compared to a lot of the stuff that it, it kind of feels like a TV movie, but the last half hour is really effective, I think, in the original. Yeah, I think that that's really what the effect they were going for. And I, I, I think, you know, um, I think that's why it became such a provocative movie at the time, because um, it had on the surface seemed like, you know, just like kind of this sense of like something happening and stuff. And, but it was like kind of to, to actually see it like, that was the shock, I guess. And, and um, mm. uh, for, I think, a movie in that time where, you know, it, it probably comes across initially as not like a Westworld kind of movie and stuff. Um, you just had this kind of thing that, like, maybe she's, you know, paranoid and, uh, you know, like, this is this a bit of, a, you know, this kind of, like, all in her head and stuff like that. You're just quite not sure until, like, things started really ramping up towards the very end. It, it, I think another movie that, that kind of has that effect is Rosemary's Baby, right, where... Yeah. Um, you just don't really suspect anything until like the very end that like, you know, there's like kind of the, the clincher, I guess, if you will, and stuff. Also written by Ira, Ira Levin. Mm. Good point. Same, same author. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I, um, I mean, I, I was just thinking about what you were saying earlier about Westworld um, in the, I guess around about the same, you know, both those 
novels came out roughly the same kind of time. That's true. And I guess, and I guess both of them do have a kind of connection of the Disneyfication, industrialized nature oh, yeah. of, of you know society and, and entertainment. Um, that's definitely the link there. It must have provoked both of those. Um, I think it had to be that idea though that like. Um, robots seem like they were kind of out in the future and stuff and yeah. then you go to an amusement park and you see like holy crap they're doing it like you know they're kind of acting real and like i think it started putting it it made it more concrete than that like up to then what you saw was like kind of things that looked very robotic and like kind of mechanical now could like be very much turned into like a you know animatronic human you know humanoid kind of uh, creature and, and i think that's what like that um struck a chord in people's psyche and stuff like that and mm. it, around that time coincidentally was where we started having this idea of the uncanny valley you know like kind yeah. of where we started getting into this idea of things appearing human but not quite you know like kind of not quite there and stuff it's funny because i mean yeah i mean the 70s there's so, there were so many unknowns about how um, things were going to progress and we kind of mentioned this in, the, in this, the talk about the box and button button absolutely but um but um in, in, it's more the fear of where this could potentially end up that drives some yes. of the stories i mean if you actually look at where animatronics has come you know you can actually <laughs> the nice thing about if you go to disney world having just been um <laughs> you know you can start with the earliest example which is the carousel of progress mm. which was 1962 that he showed mm. at the world's fair and it's 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 pretty good actually it's it's very charming um, but you compare that to something like the Navi River Journey, where you've got mm. the, the alien from Pandora, from Avatar, mm. which is a much, which is apparently their most sophisticated animatronic yet. Mm. It's still, you know, it's a robot though. You know, right, it's like right. a, you know, we're still so right, far right. away far from away, that yeah. Valley. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I forget the name of the one that uh, was kind of doing the Silicon Valley tour, like a, um, this one that's a female that like kind of oh, she's yeah. able to kind of interact and stuff like that. Um, I forget her name, but like, it, like that's part of the furthest along we've gotten so far and stuff. Yeah, but I mean, it's you know, my my daughter when she was four, she saw mm. the Navi River Journey, which and she was just like, it's, it, "That's a robot, right, Daddy?" And I'm like, "Yeah, that's right." <laughs> <laughs> so right. We, go, we get along. It's you know, their fears are you know quite <laughs> far away off from the real thing. But yeah, I mean. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, again, the, the 74 one, that was obviously a real fear. And I think, it, you know, that is tied in with the fear of feminism, basically. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. It's, again, it's the, the unknowns. Because yeah. things are starting to happen. You know, like we, we're coming out of the 60s and, you know, like kind of there's this, um, you know, birth control, free love and kind of, you know, there's all this kind of uns unsettling uncertainty. And, um, and people like overall, like, you know, or starting to kind of question, you know, like, where do I fit into all this that's going on? And I think, you know, movies like this kind of show the fear on the more, um, you know, in your face kind of level and stuff. And mm. to, to some degree, it's like kind of fear, like, you know, here we have um, the horror part of it and stuff to degree. And then in the 2004, I think uh, by then we've, I think it's almost like where it's treated a little bit more like, oh, yeah, you know, kind of haha, -ha, let's poke fun at it and stuff like that. Well, yeah, the 2000, and as I said, you know, they, it's almost like they've taken the angle that we're kind of over all of this. We're post-feminist yeah. in, the, in the 2004 one because it's, you know, uh, Nicole Kidman's character is like the superwoman who, who's, you know, hugely successful. Um, but I think, and, and there's, there's, of course, spoiler alert, the twist that it's actually the woman who's driving all of this. Mm. But, you know, is it's not really... You know, if you wanted to sort of poke holes in it, you know, it's not particularly feminist because she was betrayed by her man and that's what drove her to create it. Right. And so it's kind of like, yeah, man's still kind of responsible for the woman's behavior of replacing the women, which is, you know. Yeah. Not... And, and this kind of reminds you also of like um, our discussion about Black Christmas, where here's a woman who like is really for the other side, so to speak, and stuff, you know, because yeah, what she yeah. wanted was going back to the ways of, you know, uh, that men were men and kind of, you know, um, they yeah, knew how to yeah. treat a lady and stuff. Yeah, which is, um, I don't know, it's not, it's not an easy thing to believe. You almost kind of get the impression they did that because they just wanted to add a twist at the end because you yeah. already knew what the story was. 
And that's kind of what the whole thing with the 2004 is. The Stepford Wives as an even something that you would even describe is so well known that you mm. can't, you have to do something different with it. And their idea right. is obviously make it into a comedy so that you add, try and add some new angle. And I mean, you know, it was relatively successful, I thought, in that <laughs> respect. But obviously that didn't translate to the box office because apparently it did really badly. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, this whole thing of, I think what's really powerful about this idea of describing things as the Stepford Wives mm. is that um, what's interesting for me is that it's a location. You know, it's, mm. it's like they're describing this phenomena mm. around, a, you know, a suburb, around mm. a society, around an actual location. It's not like, I don't know, I, I find that really, I can't really describe exactly what is so interesting about that, but I think it's a very clear kind of comment on society when you when you start sort of saying describing things in this in that way well i think what that reminds me of is this idea of you know when we talk about a simpler time and stuff right that kind of, kind of thing it's things like the old west or it's like um you know main street usa or yeah. it, it's like certain terms are like kind of describing a location and i feel like that's kind of what it's being done here is it's anchoring it um and you know, like here's the step for wives is kind of made to, I think in both cases to seem like it's something that could happen in a place that like, you know, where um, they're starting this kind of experiment, right. Of, you know, mm. uh, replacing women and stuff like that. And uh, you know, like uh, that it's almost like, yeah, just like that. Like it's an experiment that like maybe it'll kind of take, and then, you know, we'll expand this to other cities as, you know, that kind of idea. I feel like that's yeah. kind of what it's, really encapsulating yeah no it's yeah i mean I, I think as well there's there's you know they're much more blatant in the underlying themes of the original in the remake in mm. the you know all the men have their remote controls because right. they're afraid of losing control right. of their wives you know they're um they are you know they basically come out and overtly say you know we're threatened by you and we wanted to kind of you know you were better than us so we've kind of felt threatened and we wanted to sort of you know all right right just um <laughs> stop feeling like the weak one and and they kind of do it to a comic effect of where they, the men are really kind of portrayed as like kind of these big kids right like kind of you know that mm. they, like i said they have their toys and then um that uh they um you know just want to have to play, in fact, the way they're portrayed in the, um, the the men's club and stuff like that versus the you know original, they're really shown as like kind of sitting there playing with battle bots and kind of you know like mm. they're shown as these big kids. I mean that's really you know like I, I mean that was really very clear. Like I, you know, I couldn't make it any more explicit and stuff the way they did it. In the, um, yeah, the remake and stuff. Yeah, and they're sort of saying you know a real man, an adult man in that time period accepts mm. women all of their sort of. Um, aspirations and things in life but also i i think there's when you talk about the actual the, the way the men are portrayed mm -hmm. it, it's kind of they are making fun i think of like um tech entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who may or may not have trophy wives or something like that mm -hmm. that was very mm -hmm. much the the uh the impression i got it was like it's much more of a you know a look at a critique of that a little bit as well of like you know you're you're trying to find something in your in, you know you're trying to make up for some other sort of uh thing in your in your <laughs> wife's appearance that you wouldn't normally have or something that was the impression i got anyway <laughs> no i think you, you hit on something there um and and you know i think uh what's called uh, it's probably you know hard to argue that, that that's kind of um that there's a lot of truth to that portrayal and stuff and uh you know because let's face it like um a lot of the the tech entrepreneurs and all that, you know, they, they have their toys or their version of toys, right? Where there's, you know, like the Teslas or, you know, um, other kind of, you know, like big, very big adult kind of toys or something like that. Um, it, it's absolutely like kind of just, you know, the, the thing that you see over and over again, like, you know, anytime that like um, you, if you're taking on a tour of like their, you know, MTV crib, whatever, it's, you know, kind of plenty of toys, like kind of lying around stuff. Absolutely. And let's not forget, of course, there are now like dating simulators and, you know, there are oh. potential people who are trying to build kind of like, you know, robots that you can date and things like this. So, you know, maybe those are the ultimate non-threatening toy. <laughs> it uh, seems to be a very odd, odd. I mean, I, I just feel like 
God, is life really so difficult that you need to just date a robot? It's kind of like abandoning <laughs> all hope of any human interaction at any level. It is, I just find it such a weirdly cynical view on life to think that that could actually be well, something you could do in seriousness. I mean, you know, one of the things along with the Me Too movement is this idea of incels, right? And that's something that kind of really struck me as, um, you know, something that like I, I couldn't even imagine as being a movement. Uh, I, I don't even know if you could call it a movement, but this trend, right, of kind of these males who, like, you swear are like kind of, um, you know, almost like asexual, you know, mm. guys who like they um, just kind of reach a certain level of maturity and then like they are just basically, you know, like I, I'm not dealing with society anymore. And, um, you know, their solution is to kind of, you know, have their, you know, wall of toys and to kind of basically, you know, like I said, not deal with like kind of um, uh, modern day questions or reality and stuff like that. And, mm. um, you know, like the extreme case of that of, apparently is these guys who like are actively like kind of, you know, just almost like the opposite of feminists and stuff that they're like, you know, totally like, you know, like, Oh, like kind of, you know, these women are ridiculous and you know, they're kind of imagining all these things and stuff like that. And um, it's all a conspiracy to kind of, you know, like kind mm. of um, take away their power even more and, you know, on and on just, I, I mean, I'm only so familiar with it myself to be honest, but from the things I've read and the things that uh, boy, I stand about, you know, these guys, I mean, they literally are just, you know, a lot of ways like the men as they portrayed in the, the you know, remake and stuff. Yeah, strange, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think um, what, what's, what's also, like going back to something that you said earlier that really I found interesting was this idea of us looking at our lives as code in a way and the patterns mm. and routines that we <laughs> follow in that, you know, um, like you said, the... the <laughs> women's uh old roles were very much a routine of like house oh, meeting yeah. and, and and routine and it, it's it's almost like what they're saying in the 2004 version is that they are literally like reprogramming women mm. as a right. um, and that's kind of you see that as almost like this is society's code for mm -hmm. what women's role is you know do you <laughs> Yeah, are you going to go the the superwoman role or the traditional role? It's mm. kind of like um, that, that. That seems to be the kind of thing they're saying in there. I mean, obviously, it's a much lighter tone because they don't kill any of the women. They right. just they just put some weird some nano chips in there. Yeah. Um, Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. It's almost like what they're saying in the 2004 version is that they are literally like reprogramming women mm. as a, right. um, and that's kind of, you see that as almost like this is society's code for mm -hmm. what women's role is. You know, do you, <laughs> yeah, are you going to go the, the superwoman role or the traditional role? It's mm. kind of like um, that, that, that seems to be the kind of thing they're saying in there. I mean, obviously, it's a much lighter tone because they don't kill any of the women. They just right. they just put some weird some nano chips in there. Yeah. And, but um. But yeah, that's kind of very much what I. It, it's it's kind of like they're trying to make some commentary on, you know, what what do you take take on board, uh, as as a woman in two thousand four. Right. And as we talked about before, that the language of the times is is you know like kind of what the technology is available. Uh, because like in the 70s, we're starting to kind of become more familiar with computers and everything. So it's not as much of that language. But here in the, you know, the remake, you know, like, it's all about programming and like, kind of, you know, like it gets down to, like you said, the actual circuitry and, and you know, describing things as like, a, you know, rewiring her or kind of, you know, on and on, like kind of the things that like now we're very techy, um, like the society is a lot more comfortable with the technology. You know, everybody has a, for the most part, has a smartphone and internet access and on and on. And I think, you know, like, whereas going back to the seventies, that was all kind of like really out there technology still at that point. And, uh, yeah. but you know, like it's interesting to see the tra transition of our language and how the, you know, people talk within the film and, uh, and the things that we're used to and stuff, like probably if you played the 2004, uh, version to somebody back then, they probably like, Whoa, what the hell is this? Like, kind of, you know, mm. It would just seem yeah, really no, out I mean, there. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I guess it's, you know, it, it shows how far the roles of women have come that you could even consider making it a kind of like a post-feminist sort of comedy mm. poking fun. Yeah. At, um, yeah that's I mean, because that's what it kind of is. It's kind of poking fun, really, at, at, mm -hmm. at feminism, or at least it tries to. I mean, I think it actually, I think that what's, what's kind of, what, what's kind of, I don't know, provocative, but also kind of doesn't quite work is that the tone is kind of of, someone poking fun at feminism you almost feel <laughs> like it's the the you know the filmmakers were a little bit kind of like the the guys playing with their toys a little bit mm. rather than actually like trying to sort of genuinely look at, at how far things have come because because yeah. i mean let's not forget as well like nicole kidman's character for whatever reason mm -hmm. tries to fit in which is again them trying right, to right, 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 right. look at this juxtaposition but i mean i don't really that kind of undermines quite a lot of the strength of her character in, in, in many ways, I think. Mm. Um, and I, and I think it, it's kind of, again, going back to this thing of coding, it's, um, it's almost like they're saying you can try to emulate this traditional model, but mm. really you need to be recoded from scratch in order to, you can never really go back to that, I guess is maybe what they're trying to say mm. as well. Man. And the and the back to it, it's what's interesting is um you know just from the opening credits and stuff, is uh, the fifties right? So that's funny yeah. how you know like a very industrial time is the um you know kind of what's seen as like kind of the ideal right like a, a simpler time a happier time and stuff, where I think now we realize looking back at fifties there are a lot of you know issues that we had that like you know we just um. You know, which is why the 60s happened to a lot of the degree, you know, like kind of that the unsettling or like kind of the things that like, you know, people weren't really happy with just all erupted. You know, like kind of, so it's funny how like on the one hand, you know, like kind of we say or, or it, you know, like it's portrayed as like kind of that's the ideal and stuff. And then, um, but then the reality is like kind of, you know, uh, actually it's not, wasn't as perfect, you know, like kind of. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's interesting about the two thousand and four is that it, it's, you know, it, uh, you know, feminism is still pretty much a work in progress in two thousand and four, mm. as is evidenced by the Me Too movement and things like this. It, <laughs> right, it was right. a little little on the early side. It's kind yeah, of like, yeah. it's a bit like if you tried to make a kind of post racism comedy where people were just you know using racial slurs left and right and going ha, 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 what a crazy thing of the past i can't imagine that would go down too well these days you know i mean i suppose blazing saddles is kind of <laughs> that's that. the first thing that came you know, up that's the first um, one that came up <laughs> and and you kind of uh, yeah it did it to it, great effect and it did it effectively i mean i'm sure it offends a lot of people and stuff but yeah. you know for the most part like it, it's did it did it in a way that like I felt like you you almost couldn't not laugh though because it was, I mean I don't know like I could see on the one hand being offended but on the other like that you know it really did a good job of like kind of that it was poking fun at it it was not like kind of just doing it for the sake of it you know like kind of I don't know I mean, that that's my well, I, I would I would say the difference is that with Blazing Saddles they basically make that make the point that basically everybody is racist like this right, society right, right, is completely right. right america is almost like founded on a fundamental layer of racism and right. it makes no kind of it's, it's quite it's brutal in that yeah, respect yeah. whereas something like um you know the 2004 version of stepford wives feels a little toothless it feels mm. like it's trying to kind of play both sides mm -hmm. a little bit too much and i don't mm. really feel like it really committed to getting on either sort of being brutally mm. post-feminist mm. or being actually like, you know, in mm. being more sort of like edgy and, and, and feminist in the other respect. And in some respects, I would say the, the original is a much more extreme movie in that mm -hmm. respect. Cause I mean, right. they're killing these women. It's pretty, it doesn't <laughs> yeah. get much more extreme than that as a, as a reaction they're trying to portray. Yeah. That's an interesting point. I mean, that like, um, it, it's very much like, in your face as to like kind of what i mean I, I don't know like i feel like at the other hand in the 2004 version um i you know like it, one of the things that it did do was like even introduce like kind of you know gay couples right and, and that, i think that was like a really interesting idea of like kind of how there's still this kind of um 
masculine, you know, even if you don't call it mm. male per se stuff, role and then and in the uh, a feminine role uh, in in the couple and stuff. I mean, I mean what's interesting is like kind of, you know, again, I, I I'm talking a little bit out of my butt because I only know some of the you know folks who are you know uh, in uh, gay relationships stuff like that, but it, it's it's from what I've observed, what I've kind of know is that like there is still like kind of this, you know, male kind of role, stuff like that, um, and versus a female. And then it's interesting how they show that that's like kind of the, the, the in that couple, the one that, you know, kind of was the more female one, you know, or, or feminine in that sense, um, was the one that was like kind of, you know, converted, you know, like kind of to, um, to a Republican. A Republican. <laughs> this, is kind of, this is kind of bizarre. But I mean, I did feel like his, you know the character before that was very stereotypical yeah it's kind yeah. of like just like beat you around the face but i guess that right, was right. part of the idea of trying right, to right. contrast to those difficult ones that, right. to get right there but um yeah i mean the other thing that that but i was thinking a lot when i watched this movie was um it made me think of bombshell i don't know if you've seen that oh, the new i haven't yet, yet. the new it, it's you know it's based on um kind of like the the me too movement and the mm. the, the news reporters at fox news right right and um them uh, sort of all basically in one way or another um filing complaints against the guy who ran it right and in a funny sort of way when you see matthew, matthew broderick driving through stepford looking at all these sort of like pristine uh, Stepford wives mm -hmm. and just sort of like marveling, like how can this be? Mm. That is exactly what I sort of like feel like when I'm watching Fox News, because I just think, oh. how can all these kind of like women, surely they know right. what they look like and what right. they're, you know, they look so stereotypical. How can this right. actually be a real thing? And that's really what it made me feel like. And now you've also got a, a kind of a, a take of, you know, people being, programmed on a mm. on a way of like this is how our studio functions and this yeah. is what you need to do in order to to be on tv you have to sort of follow the program yeah i mean that's one of those things that like um you know like being around hollywood and la and all that you really see that it's insidious in the sense of where um you know until we've had kind of like these different movies or like kind of you know certain steps you know forward um you know, things have been pretty much done the way they've been done, like, uh, because, you know, you have the execs who, you know, fall in line and then, you know, all the people under them fall in line and you know, on and on. Like, so everybody kind of like, you know, like whether you call it group think, whatever, um, people just kind of like, just, you know, like, oh, it's done this way. We don't, you know, like um, the line from Westworld that I think of is like, you know, I don't see anything. Like, I don't, you know, I don't see any problem, right? right? Kind of, I think there's a lot of that effect that like, you know, people are, um, whether again we call it programming or conditioning and stuff that like you know they don't see a problem you know until like a me too movement happens or until something that kind of you know like really like kind of is a splash of cold water in their face and everything yeah and i think and a good line from the, the original stepford wives is like when mm. when she realizes that all the women have been killed you know she says to diz she says you know mm. why and his right. reply is because we can and wow, that is yeah, very sort yeah. of like, you know, yeah. that's, that really yes. feels relevant with a lot of stuff that's going on these days. Yeah, absolutely. Because there, there were no checks and balances. So. That's it. That's exactly the, the key um, problem is that like, you know, and I feel like, um, you know, if there's one kind of underlying theme to both of them is that like unchecked kind of, you know, um, power um, will result in this kind of, you know, world where like then, you know, depending on, who's in charge and how they picture the way things go or should go is the way things will go, you know, like, uh, because the power is unchecked, you know, like, uh, there's nothing mm. to stop them. I mean, that's really what it comes down to in both cases. And I think that's the thing that like, uh, um, you know, in both cases where we talk about the roles of men and women and everything is that like, you know, for thousands of years, right. That's been, you know, like, kind of, you know, it's been a very much, um, the, the male hierarchy and stuff. And, um, you know, like women didn't have a right to vote until like the twenties, you know, like kind of good Lord, you know, yeah. kind of, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's amazing that like there wasn't a revolt before that. You know, kinda. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, and I mean, I think it's, it's you know, you take for granted a lot of these 70s movies we watch, you know, abortion was still illegal <laughs> in various parts of the yeah. world and all yeah. this, kind of, you know, lots of stuff. Yeah. I feel like for some of these conversations, this goes back to the discussion you and I have had offline that like, I wish we had, you know, a, a woman who was interested in these kind of discussions because I would love yeah. to have their take on it. Like, you know, I'm glad you kind of, you know, you dove into like, or you, you've kind of different times, like, you know, research some of the feminist kind of views and everything. And uh, I, 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 I'm, you know, as much as, you know, I try to be open-minded, as much as I try to, you know, read about these different ideas and stuff, I know that I'm blind to it. Because again, like, you know, it's like that line, you know, like, you know, I don't see anything like that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I, I, I just think it's an interesting takes on, on these. And we seem to be watching a lot of sort of, um, I would say, uh, female-centric feminist mm. sort of um, inter interestingly feminist movies lately. And right. I, I think it, it's very interesting to see how they're kind of, you know, but yeah, you're right. It would be, it would be nice. It would be nice to get <laughs> another perspective on it. Definitely. Rather than our best attempts to sort of, uh, channel it maybe. But yeah. The other thing that just sort of occurred to me as we were talking with this idea of like the power, the checks and balances that are unchecked, you know, that, that go, that aren't there. And, in the Stepford Wives, you've got a suburb as this place where mm. powerful people within that suburb, mm -hmm. have, you know, they can control everything. Yeah. And that's actually in a, in a fun, you know, a lot of Stephen King movies, we've talked about this before as well, mm -hmm. how he often bases his things in suburbs or small yeah. towns. And I think that's, you know, that's this idea that, you know, a small group of people can be completely, have their mindset completely changed. Mm. or have the circumstances be you know completely manipulated um and it's kind of there's likewise at the start they talk about the city and the suburbs and how you could be yourself there's this idea that you can't kind of control everything in a city mm. like you could in a small town um yeah that's just a that's, that's something that obviously it, it goes back to a lot of the other talks we've had in terms of horror movies um but i mean also it's like you know why do so many people move to the cities it's because mm. you know it's going to be more multicultural you know you can't you can't all be sort of uh racist or sexist when there's like a billion <laughs> people there it's just right. not going to work really is it so yeah and, and um it, it's funny how you know the a lot of the horror i guess um happens in real life in cities of uh you know, like kind of, you know, just by sheer numbers, um, it's it's just bound to have more crime. It's bound to have more, you know, accidents. It's bound to have more, you know, just things that like um, living and dying and stuff like that is just going to happen more just by simple, you know, law of averages and everything. And um, yeah. I, I think, again, it's like kind of just, it's it's something that, again, is our in our psyche, the striking contrast between, you know, what we kind of envision like kind of is very, calm and quiet, you know, being out in the suburbs and stuff. And then, you know, I kind of, I think at some point we'll probably dive into that more in some future movies of uh, that. Um, the reality is that like, there's a lot of horror that kind of happens, um, you know, like whether it's, you know, some psychopath or, you know, serial killer and everything, um, you know, that's actually, you know, like kind of, we've mentioned before about mind killer where, you know, you started realizing that like around that time period, they really saw the patterns that were just always there, but because of forensics, because of um, data collection that, you know, didn't exist before that, the patterns just were, were not noticed. You know, like, again, I, yeah. I feel like that's something that we're echoing again, that line, you're like, I don't see anything, you know, like, you know Absolutely, it, yeah, yeah. That, Putting that the patterns be... together. <laughs> the, other, the, other thing, the other thing that occurred to me as we mm -hmm. were talking about this was, you know, the recent remake of Black Christmas, Mm -hmm. I kind of feel they've taken, it's like bizarro Stepford Wives in mm -hmm. that they've kind of, you know, yeah. rather than having the women as like the robots that are all being controlled, mm -hmm. it's kind of like all the men are the ones that are all being controlled. Right. It's sort of supernatural rather than kind of a robotic thing. But it's it's kind of, yeah, they've tried to kind of flip flip it a little bit, I think, with that movie. Yeah, and um, that's something that is kind of between the three of them, you know, like kind of, uh, or, or the Black Christmas, and then, you know, we take the original and the remake of uh, uh, Stepford Wives is this idea of a secret society, right? Like kind of being mm -hmm. behind everything. That's like, again, a recurring theme as well. Um, and 
you know, that's the kind of the things of like, uh, you know, I'm sure you probably have heard of the Freemasons and like kind of all the, you know, myths around that. And I have some good friends who are Freemasons, actually. <laughs> so, in, fa in, fact, in fact, the guy who I used to live next to was the head guy of the Freemasons. <laughs> and, uh, mm. So I was like, yeah. He, and, kept, he kept trying to get me to join, but I, I right, didn't right. do it. But, uh, <laughs> and, and even like, you know, fraternities, right? Like kind of that's another like, um, you know, and these again, like it's funny how um, sororities kind of slowly evolved and stuff like that. Uh, but, the, but then what they did is like kind of they, they copied, you know, fraternities, right? Which were the original like mm -hmm. kind of idea of these kind of, you know, secret societies and kind of, um, and, you know, whether it's for Freemasons or these kind of, you know, five, you know, whatever, Kappa and Beta, whatever, like kind of, um, it, it's interesting how there's this idea that like behind everything happening, there's this kind of power elite, you know, like kind of the Illuminati, right? Like kind of that, that uh, they are really the ones pulling the strings on everything that's going on. Well, and I think that that's also, you know, that's a point they're making in the original Stepford Wives as well, mm -hmm. is that, you know, the men are kind of like the unit of patriarchy and controlling mm -hmm. things from behind the scenes. And the women don't have an equivalent. They're all kind of mm. like isolated. Right, right. And then they're picked off. You know, there's kind of like, right. um, they talk about getting these together, but, you know, they get picked off on the way mm -hmm. to doing one by that. one. And, and then they try and do that in the 2004 one a mm -hmm. bit more. But again, it's a similar kind of yeah. um, thing in that. But, uh, yeah. And, you know, as a funny kind of uh, mirror of, you know, kind of the times and stuff, what we started realizing is that like there is some truth to it in the sense of where, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, things that have kind of come to light with the Me Too movement is these, uh, you know, things that kind of were more or less collusion, even if you don't call it conspiracy, it's just that the fact that like, you know, guys are kind of, you know, like kind of, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, kind of like, oh yeah, kind of, you know, um, that's okay. You know, I kind of, you know, you're, cause you're a guy and kind of, and, um, you know, like the things that like were just overlooked and that, you know, like I, I've even seen on YouTube, like kind of some of these videos of like kind of where, um, you know, some of the, these people that now we're calling monsters, but then, you know, like kind of right now public, you know, they're kind of, you know, eulogize as like kind of these saints and stuff like that. Right. And um, so there is some degree, like kind of just that effect that like, you know, uh, that these things were going on and, Everybody knew about it, and not, but on the surface, like it was all kind of like, you know, like oh, everything's fine, like kind of, you know, again, <laughs> that line, you know, keeps coming up. I don't see anything, <laughs> like. Kinda. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think as well around two thousand and four is a very is again, it's kind of like I think you see a lot of resurgence of conspiracy. Mm -hmm based themes or yeah. paranoid themes in movies simply because, and I'm going to blame YouTube mostly for this. Right, right, right. Is because, you know, when, when we started getting the internet started becoming more pervasive, which is really only the late nineties, mm -hmm. you know, before that, most people weren't really yeah. online and yeah. certainly didn't have access to video and things like this. It was really then the early two thousands when you started getting a lot of conspiracy theory mm -hmm. going around and people started getting into it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that's why you also, you know, that's kind of why these sort of themes have a bit more traction, why they, they're getting sort of remade in 2004. Yeah. I, Cause I mean, if you ask me, if, if, you, if you asked me in the nineties, <laughs> whether there was a secret race of lizards <laughs> running, running society, uh -huh. I was like, what, what the, you know, whereas if you, if you fast forward 10 years and people mm -hmm. are going, oh, you know, could be possible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just sign of the times. Cer certainly there's enough people talking about it, you know, and it's on the internet. So therefore it must be true. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that was, yeah. I mean, that, that was the problem. There was no concept of fake news. Back mm, then either, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, thank goodness that, you know, there's kind of, um, what's called the uh, sites like Snopes and, you know, like kind of just, just, you know, various, folks were at least doing some attempt to fight the tide and stuff, but it's so overwhelming, right? It's so much that there's, um, it, that it's all around you and you're just being bombarded by it and, and it's being spread like kind of, you know, and that's absolutely why different times that like, you know, whether it's um, uh, just kind of sensational news, even if it's true and stuff like that, even if it's kind of, can be verified. I just don't feel the need to spread it because like, I just feel like, you know, there's, there's enough of a, kind of viral effect is, you know, like, kind of, and, you know, again, like, it's funny how that term comes from, you know, like kind of this thing that like basically 
um, uses the DNA of a host and then, you know, replicates itself, right? I mean, that's, mm. that's really what we do with, like, kind of, you know, the, whether it's fake news or these different things that, like, you know, like, I mean, the world would just be better if it wasn't spread, you know? Like, kind of, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I kind of wonder, actually, whether we're on the verge of a kind of a post-viral society. Mm. I wonder if people have, have reached maximum viral and maximum fake news are going to mm. start just and and i think the the easiest way to you know be more objective about this stuff is just simply not to just tune out of it completely yeah, yeah. you know and just pick up a book on economics <laughs> or history or politics you know you're probably gonna you know a, a decent sort of reference book for that you'll probably come away considerably more educated than you will spending the same amount of time <laughs> trawling through I mean, I, I listened to someone the other day who was saying that, you know, they think intelligence levels in general society have just dropped massively <laughs> as a result of um, the internet, social media, everything else. Because yeah. people just don't really think cl cr critically anymore. They just react emotionally. I mean, that just goes back to, you know, Fahrenheit 451, where, um, you know, that the irony is that... Uh, the person who picks up a book is described as the one that's, you know, antisocial and stuff. And, mm. and meanwhile, you know, like kind of uh, what's considered social is just being, you know, kind of bombarded by media and, and everything. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny, right? Because that book is what from the sixties, I want to say, um, mm. you know, so way before there was even this glimpse of a thing called the internet, but I guess we did have some sign of like television being kind of the precursor of, of that effect of like kind of that people were be just because basically, you know, absorbed by this thing that kind of just throws all this kind of stuff at you and everything. Um, yeah. I think, I think he just kind of caught on to what was kind of happening at, at yeah. that point and stuff. Yeah. Going back to the carousel of progress very, mm. very briefly, uh -huh. one of the funniest things and that's quite cynical um, it's uh, when when you go when you see the 1920s mm -hmm. carousel of progress and there's some some you know there's a the guy's describing oh it's amazing this thing has beamed into everyone's home and I'm sure in ten years I'm sure in ten years I can see like people learning Greek and you know Latin right, right. from from these things it will be a wonder and then in the other room you've got the uh, the the grandma watching a boxing match and going go on hit him in the hit him in the left you know and the grandpa's just sleeping away there and you're just mm -hmm. like yeah this is this is pretty interesting. And Coming from could, the guy that, that basically has had such a major hand in crafting, you know, a lot of <laughs> right, right, media. Right. And then, you know, the irony, you know, comes in that like, then you can say that again in the eighties, right? Like, Oh, you know, like kind of there's this thing called the internet and we'll be able to kind of have information that'll, you know, mm -hmm. like you said, you can learn Greek and you know, all these different things. And to some degree, thank goodness we do do it. But what do we do? We watch cat videos and, yeah. you know, I kind of, you know, um, pranks and you know on and on like kind of you know like when i saw my nephew like kind of just absorb like kind of prank video after prank video i was like god like kind of you know like you know like um never mind mtv and like kind of that uh what was that that jackass show and stuff but mm. it's like that was limited because it was only on certain times right and stuff but now you have this media or, or this medium that provides it uh, access to it 24 7 like uh, any second that you want to watch some dumb kind of prank whatever there it is <laughs> i mean for me it's just like so little wit left you know there's mm -hmm. no sort of humor in language it's just everyone's just watching someone fall off a chair or hit their head on something and it's like oh, 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 oh. Yeah, I just I just despair at the human race when I see people crowded around <laughs> watching this stuff. But that in itself, I mean, it, it's kind of the fact that I even get kind of upset about it is quite funny and actually makes it funny <laughs> in, a, in a reverse kind of way. So, but anyway, we're we're coming across as uh, old people complaining <laughs> about social media now. Yeah, <laughs> we've already tried to edit this part out. But. Well, back in our day, we used to go yeah. out and play. <laughs> You could turn up at someone's house unannounced. You didn't have to text them. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so any, any final thoughts on Stepford Wives? How would you, if you were going to remake mm. it again, yeah. how would you do it? You know, I, I, I think the, the strongest aspect that in both cases um, is the fear of, you know, and the uncertainty of 
men and women's roles. I think that's something like to me, mm-hmm. like to, to do that smartly would be so like, I, I think there's room for like a, a more modern version. Um, you know, something of course, you know, like without being like a, a black dresses where you're spelling things out for people and like kind of doing tons of exposition and then having some bizarre conspiracy that like you said, like kind of where it mm-hmm. doesn't make any sense and everything. Um, I think, you know, like, one way to kind of do it would be to kind of where you show um, how, you know, like kind of social media and stuff is like kind of taking over people's, you know, minds and everything. And yeah. um, I think that's something like would be effective, like kind of that, you know, you can use some very pretty much modern technology to kind of, you know, do it in a way that's not so bizarre where like kind of inserting chips into people's brains and stuff, just embedding yeah, yeah. it through media. And that's that's what I was going to say, exactly the same sort of angle. What I would Mm. do is have something like, you know, this person thinks these are like the trends Mm -hmm. in society, but they realize like they're actually, you know, someone is kind of controlling their their internet profile on a smaller Mm. and smaller scale to the point where they're kind of like, you know, being manipulated within Mm. that kind of area of town and stuff. I think the other other, um, uh, big sort of point of it is the fear of losing control. Mm. And so I would also try and right. sort of put into that. And I don't think, I think you can do it in a cleverer way that doesn't have chips being put in people's brains mm. or people being replaced by robots. Yeah. I think you can do it in, in a much more sort of cleverer way of, of, you know, just sort of what kind of engineered social control could you enact on people if you, you know, used every available mm-hmm. piece of technology. And Cambridge Analytica is a very good example of just what can be achieved mm. if you do that. So yeah. it's... Uh, you know, yeah, there's definitely scope for it to be to be remade, and I think, yeah, definitely looking at sort of uh, male and female roles um, is really would be interesting as well to see. Because I feel like Jordan Peele with Get Out really did that with the, you know, like he, he almost did a um, a racism perspective of Stepford Wise, right? Because mm. you know what happened was if you if you're not familiar with the story, I, I don't know. Hopefully, it's not a spoiler. Um, yeah, you, you yeah, will, but it's okay. We need, we need to finish the video, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I it's my fault. I've been, I've been saying for about three months yeah, to watch it now. And I I, in fact, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. That, like, that, right, that, you okay. know, I think that's enough information right there that w- won't give away too much of, like, kind of, you know, what really makes it effective and stuff. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I don't want to do, ruin it for you because it's one that, like, you know, to, to, to go into it with just some idea of what's going on because you probably have some idea from the previews and stuff like that. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so I think beyond that, you don't need any more that, that like, um, because anything, I think anything more would ruin the effect of the movie and stuff. And I feel like some movies okay. like that are just absolutely gems because of how, you know, when you are just drawn into the story and you're kind of going along for the ride that then, you know, the hands of a really good filmmaker, like, um, like him, it, it just, it, it's, it's, powerful in that you not only buy into what's happening and stuff but it's kind of like makes you kind of take pause until like kind of the, the truth that's revealed through that and mm. um it, they're, they're just absolute gems and so that's why i don't want to ruin it for you and stuff yeah no appreciate it appreciate it i was thinking actually that there must have been a remake of rosemary's baby i'm sure someone yeah remade i wonder it. yeah you know that would be think, nice that right. that'd be a nice follow-up to do another ir11 um Right. Um, movie. I'm. I'm sure he's. He's done quite a few good um, yeah. movies that have been translated into films. So we can probably find some more. Yeah. Certainly, you, if you would think that, like you said, that like it's a natural. Um, you know, like we, we've done all these remakes of like movies that like you almost think that like why did they remake it and everything, and mm-hmm. then here's one like you know it just seems like you know like you know almost like why didn't they remake it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm sure it must be. There must be one. I yeah. We'll have to look it up. Been <laughs> That'll be one one for the books if it hasn't actually right. like classic seventies horror that hasn't been remade. Then it's <laughs> shocking in itself. Anyway. Right. Well, speaking of more kind of paranoia, and the next set of remakes we'll be doing is uh, Vision of the Body Snatchers. It's one that we've talked about for some time. That like we we got to do it, and, and I think it's uh, absolutely like kind of time. And uh, I think it's going to be a, a great kind of discussion that of some of the ideas that we've already covered even this week of um you know suburban slash paranoia and uh yeah so looking forward to kind of talking about that one (laughs) absolutely yeah looking forward to it so once again uh thanks for watching and uh, be sure to like and subscribe and i'm john chang with uh dead edmonds and we'll catch you next time